بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله الأمين مساء الخير على الجميع أنا أخوكم بروفيسور أحمد متولي مؤسس جمعية طب وزراعة الكلى في المملكة العربية السعودية وأني لي الشرف اليوم أن أشارككم وأتشرف بتقديم كل من أخوان الدكتور عبد العزيز حافظ وهو استشاري في مستشفى المانع في الخبر وهو أحد أعضاء الجمعية النشيطين جزاه الله خير وهو راح يدير الجلسة المتحدث هو بروفيسور سعيد الغامدي أبو عبد العزيز وهو معروف لدى الجميع أستاذ أمراض الباطنة والكلى سابقا كان في جامعة الملك عبد العزيز والآن الريجنال مانجر لشركة دايفيرم في المنطقة الغربية احنا سعيدين بوجودهم ونشكرهم جميعا واشكر الان في هذه اللحظة شركة بوهرينجر انجنهايم لدعمهم المستمر لجمعيتنا وجمعيتكم انتم دائما يقدموا لنا العون في النشاط العلمي للجمعية واشكر ايضا ايفنت جروب لدعمهم اللوجستي وتواجدهم معنا ولجميع الشكر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم توكل على الله ونبدا الدكتور عبد العزيز حافظ باداره الجلسه دكتور عبد العزيز يقدم نفسك وقدم الدكتور سعيد شكرا جزيلا معكم السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمه الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعليه وصحبه أجمعين معكم أخوكم دكتور عبد العزيز الحافظ استشاري الباطنة والكلام مستشفى المانع بالدمام رئيس قسم الدياليسز ونائب رئيس قسم الباطنية في مستشفى المانع بالدمام بداية أشكر لكم حضوركم جميعا في هذه النشاط الجميل الرائع وأرفع جزيل الشكر إلى جمعيتنا الموقرة جمعية السعودية لأمراض الكلى متمثلة في مؤسس الجمعية البروفيسور أحمد متولي ورئيس الجمعية دكتور خالد ونائبه دكتور سنيد وباقي الأعضاء طبعا الجمعية غنية عن التعريف وببركات هذه الجمعية طبعا في على مدى تقريبا نقول من سبع إلى عشر سنوات جمعية السعودية لأمراض زراعة الكلى تعد من أكابر الجمعيات عربيا وعالميا وحاليا طبعا الجمعية تقوم بنشاط فريد من نوعه مقارنة بالدول الأخرى أو الجمعيات الأخرى في الدول الأخرى لا يكاد يمر أسبوع من دون أن نرى أي نشاط علمي ثقافي في جميع مناطق المملكة في مختلف تخصصات الكلوية طب الكلى، زراعة الكلى، التخصصات الأخرى التي تتعلق بالكلى، كارديفاسكولار، اندوكراين، ميتابوليك. آه، هذه الليلة نشاطنا مميز لسببين. السبب الأول التبك أو الموضوع المحاضرة أو موضوع النشاط إنه في التريتمنت أو في ديابيتيك نفروباثي. طبعا ديابيتيك نفروباثي من الأمراض لا يكاد يمر يوم دون ان نواجه نحن جميعا كنفرولوجيست او انترنست او فاميلي ميديسن اي من هذه أو هؤلاء المرضى لذلك من المحتم علينا ان نتثقف وننظر الى الابديت وكومبليت مانجمنت الى اخر ما وصلت اليه البحوث والجايد لاين السبب الثاني لتميز هذا اللقاء وجود البروفيسور دكتور سعيد القامدي أستاذ طب الباطنة والكلى في جامعة الملك عبد العزيز والمدير الطبي لدايفيرم ديابت ديالس سنتر من جدة عند المدير الطبي لبرنس عبد المجيد ديالس سنتر من جدة ولكم دكتور سعيد تصحيح يا عبد العزيز عمر الجمعية 23 سنة أنا أقصد عشر سنوات من النشاط المتفاني في الديكي يعني اللي راح هذا 
كانت نشاط يعني موجود لكن في الاونه الاخيره تضاعف هذا النشاط. طيب بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على اشرف الانبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين. اشكر الاستاذ الدكتور احمد متولي اللي هو يعتبر ابو الكلى عندنا في السعوديه وحقيقه ننظر اليه بتقدير واعجاب كلما سلكنا هذا المسلك يعني. جزاك الله خير ابو حسن وكذلك اشكر اخي عبد العزيز الحافظ على تقديم الجميل بالنسبه لي واشكر بولينغ لينجرهايم. انا حتكلم الان الحين عن ال 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 السبجكت حق التوداي اللي هي نوفل تريتمنت فور ديابيتيك نفروباثي والحقيقه الو سعيد نعم يعطيك العافيه بس ممكن تعمل شير سكرين للعرض ما هو شير اي مو شير ممكن تعمل بس شير اه اوكي خلاص خلاص طيب سليم يعطيك العافيه تمام سلايد شو اذا تبغى نبدا قول لي ابدا ممتاز الان تبدا طيب بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله حياكم الله I'll, I'll talk today about the novel treatment of diabetic nephropathy which is really a big subject but I'll try to be, uh, uh, do my best to try to uh, finish in time. But first of all, before we proceed, we have to look at the issue, the problem itself of diabetic kidney disease. And we look at this very beautiful paper, which all the time I bring it in most of my presentations, about uh, two decades of CKD in the world, and looked at comparison between the, the two decades. And they found in that study that there is increased incidence of uh, CKD by 89%. Increased preference by 18%, death rate due to CKD by 98%, and uh, increased disability adjusted life uh, uh, by 63%. And they thought that probably due to the geographical change and demographic expansions, but also due to the uh, increasing tide of epidemic of diabetes. If you look at this study, it suggests uh, about diabetes and chronic kidney disease in the United States population from 2009 to 2014, looked at two study population, one of them diabetic, one of them non-diabetic. Uh, all of them, they have no known uh, CKD, but on uh, screening of, of an enhanced study uh, over uh, uh, 15 years period, they found, a uh, uh, five years period, sorry, they found there is actually 25% of diabetic, they have any CKD, and 16% they have actually increased albumin creatine ratio or decreased GFR by 12%. When you compare it to non-diabetic, it's quite clear here to reach that that at that time that any any diabetic population, if you screen them, you find at least 24%, 25% of them, they have uh, uh, disease, yes? Uh, then if you look at uh, as the globe itself, not just only United States of America, if you look at the globe itself, comparing to enhanced United States of America compared to South uh, Central South America, and uh, the Europe, uh, Italy, and uh, uh, indigenous Australia. If you look at the dark brown here, which is really GFR less than 60, if you look at the albuminia by uh, orange color, and the green, which is albuminia and GFR, you find actually significant proportion, uh, almost half of the population they have actually, uh, uh, based with the type 2 diabetes, they have evidence of CKD. So if you talk any population around with diabetes, they have about uh, up to 50% of that population, they have uh, actually uh, some CKD. And it's become as much more uh, uh, clear for known reason in indigenous Australian populations. Not only this, but also there is also cardiovascular disease, which are quite common in patients with diabetes and with diabetic kidney disease. And you find, for example, in this study, if, if diabetes study is 6%, there is actually heart failure if that's up to 2%, stroke, MI, and others. So it's really actually a disease, diabetes and CKD associated with increased cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And this is actually really quite astonishing. If, if they looked at the newly diagnosed diabetes, newly diagnosed diabetics, there is 18% of them, they have already CKD, uh, cardiovascular disease. And 8.8% .8 they have GFRs dropped less than 60, and 13% they have also albuminuria. That's which explains why we have some patients just recently diagnosed diabetes and they present with diabetic nephropathy because the disease has been missed uh, diabetes for many years. When you look at the dialysis population, this is a study uh, of ours in DOPS group, we looked at the GCC countries, patients who are really on dialysis. And the astonishing thing about this one, I'm not talking about the mortality, which is really quite double that 
more than double that of non-diabetic population. But I want to show you something here. Saudi uh, diabetes population, there is 45% of patients who are dialysis, they, are, uh, they have diabetes in Saudi Arabia. But you compare them to other Gulf Cooperation Council like Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, and uh, United Arab Emirates, about 70% of that populations who are on dialysis, they are actually diabetic. I'm not saying that the diabetes is the cause of uh, insanity, but they have actually diabetes. And the poor that control of diabetes here, uh, if you have 6.7 as a reference of this mortality, but the more you have higher hemoglobin A1C, you tend to have high morbidity and mortality. So the question brings us, what's the better physiology of diabetic nephropathy? And actually, before we say diabetic nephropathy, we have to better to name it as diabetic kidney disease because there is not only diabetic nephropathy, which we see it in the classical uh, uh, histopathology, but there is other glomerular disease, either primary or secondary, might also appear in diabetic. And there is also non-glomerular disease might be seen in diabetic, like the vascular hypertension, the vascular disease, and industrial arthritis. Not to mention some medication, radio contrast administration might affect the kidney patient. So diabetic nephropathy best described in type 1 diabetes when they are uh, more than 15 to 25 years of diabetes, uh, while in type 2 is actually more than 5 years, and sometimes you could see it like that study which I showed in patients actually less than 5 years. Usually associated with retinopathy, proliferative type, in 70% of the cases, and proteinuria is present in most of the cases, sometimes can present as the fortecranish proteinuria. And about 50% of those cases, they will progress to end-stage renal disease. This study from uh, China has looked at uh, does all patients with diabetes they progress to say if or no? Because there are certain group of patients here on the top they don't progress, but there is other group they can progress uh, down 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 progression to of the kidney functions uh, at different magnitude. Some of them are very rapidly progressing for a few years period, four years period. Some of them take up to ten years for progression, and that's heterogeneity. Uh, of better uh, uh, and, and, and drop in GFR has been found in the Chinese population. And one of the theories there actually is hypertension. Second thing is the genetic background. Genetics cannot be ignored at all. Actually, there is uh, 24 genetic variants has been described uh, in diabetic nephropathy. And we did actually King uh, Faisal Special Hospital study a few years ago, actually at time for, uh, in breast for publication. We looked at actually different uh, SNPs and different gene loci, and we found at least seven genes. What, what we did, we have chosen 70 patients with diabetic property, 70 patients with diabetes without the property, and another more than 70 in patients who are not diabetic are healthy. And what we found that these seven genes are really quite common, and this description of the gene and the SNPs, which is uh, located, and actually, though, they are more associated with diabetic nephropathy. If you look at diabetic property from a histopathological point of view, most of it really can present with a diffuse mesangial uh, sclerosis, but the rare form of uh, hipless steel well solution, which is nodular glomerular sclerosis, can occur also. But these are the three variants, either mesangialysis or the diffuse type or nodular type, you could see it in kidney biopsy. Regarding what are the, 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 the cause for this one, uh, most of the people they were talking over many years be, uh, over on the hemodynamic theory. Hemodynamic theory states that with the hyperglycemia, you tend to have afferent arteriolar vasodilatation, and at the same time, efferent arterial vasoconstriction due to the concentration of ACE receptors here. And then when you have this one high, when here is really constricted, you tend to increase intraglomerular pressure, and here increase proteinuria and cause more glomerular sclerosis. Fuad Ziada was really the first, actually, to look into other theories other than hemodynamic theory. He said, of course, that with diabetes, with the hyperglycemia, you tend to have hypertension and angiotensin II uh, release. Uh, but more important, they found that TGF-beta has been increased in diabetic, which might cause, actually, sclerosis also. But also, uh, uh, VGF uh, has been uh, described uh, to, to increase also vascular epithelial growth factor, and all will increase intraglomerular pressure and at the same time increase fibrosis and sclerosis in the glomeruli. So management, management landscape should not just concentrate on the hemodynamic theory, it's concentrate about different theories, and most importantly, we have to look into diabetic control, optimum blood pressure control, 
ACE or ARB uh, use, treatment of hyperlipidemia, weight reduction, and recently SGLT2 inhibitors, GLPA agonists, and MRA, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. So I put this slide to look at that there is certainly we are dealing with three domains of diabetic kidney disease, especially diabetic apropathy. The first domain is the metabolic theory. And I think we have to have adequate blood sugar control. And this has been shown by a variety of studies, which are shown some of them. And this can be controlled by a variety of things, and still other, but most recently SGLT2 inhibitors and GLPA1 agonist. The hemodynamic theory, which will be running over three decades, uh, mostly concentrating about ACE and ARB uh, use. But you know that ACE and ARB only reduce the risk by 16 to 18 to 20 percent only. So still there is a huge effect we have to deal with. But unfortunate enough recently to have the SGA2 inhibitors, which has actually reduced the hem intraglobular uh, hemodynamics and hence decreased the proteinuria and decreased the progression of CKD. More recently, the inflammatory and fibrotic theory has been introduced, and there is many, many studies about different agents has been used. The only successful one of them is phenylalanine or a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. So if you look at the blood pressure, adequate blood pressure control and the real outcome, everybody remember 1993, there was a study and the diabetes control uh, and complication trial research group would looked at ad, uh, intensive blood sugar control, and they found that if you intensively control blood sugar, and this is the study, you reduce actually clinical nephropathy by 54%. Secondly, the blood pressure control, and this many, many study has been uh, showing that uh, if you control blood pressure, you tend to reduce the progression of CKD. And the first one is ASK uh, trial, which showed risk reduction in GFR decline and this stage of disease or death with the ACE inhibitor, beta blockade, or calcium shell blocker. But most of the effect was ribavirin versus amlodipine by 38% risk reduction. Then we have the United Kingdom prospective diabetic study called UKPDS study, which showed that you have to either to control blood sugar, blood sugar uh, very well, but to reduce by 25%, but also if you control blood pressure to 144 to 82, you tend to reduce the macro vascular endpoints by 37%. This has brought us actually to the ACE on ARP use in attenuating CKD and type 2 diabetes. And there is many, many of the studies, especially for ARPs. You have the prevent study and the ERMA, LIFE for the Losartan, IDENT with the Herbisartan, RENAL with the Losartan, and you tend. But I'll show you here one study here where they compare actually looked at patients who are having type 2 diabetes by barbing, type 2 diabetes, who have microalbuminuria and they observe them over two years period, and what they found that if you use either placebo or 150 milligram of herbisartan versus 300 milligram of herbisartan, this will result in 70% risk reduction uh, uh, compared to placebo. But certain, uh, so this actually, it's dose dependent, high dose actually, which did not redu produce any hypotension in diabetic uh, population ERMA2 study. When you compare the renal study, which looked at losartan versus placebo, Whereas IDENT were looked at herbis sertan for but the patients were really having established diabetic nephropathy. And in renal study, there is this reduction about 60% here of, from, uh, uh, of, of uh, renal outcome, primary composite uh, re renal and ca cardiovascular outcome. While if you look at the IDENT, which looked at the renal outcome, reduction up to 24, uh, 22%. Now we'll come to the subject of uh, discussion for today, which is the SGLT2 inhibitors. The SGLT2 inhibitors, actually, if you compare it to RAS inhibitor, RAS will actually, either if you, you take about ACE or ARM, it causes vasodilatation of efferent arteriole, and hence you reduce intraglomerular pressure and reduce proteinuria and reduce glomerular sclerosis and progressive decline of good uh, function. But the SGLT2 inhibitors, it has uh, actually the effect on afferent arteriole, by, by restoration of the uh, tubular glomerular feedback mechanism will lead to vasoconstriction of afferent arteriole. Here they cause vasodilatation by ACE or R, cause vasodilatation of efferent arteriole to reduce arterial pressure. But here, no, it works on the afferent arteriole and actually more vasoconstriction after the restoration of the TGF mechanism. And hence you restore the intraglomerular pressure, reduce proteinuria, and reduce reduction of the GFR and progressive decline of kidney function. 
Embegloflazin has been uh, the prime of the, this uh, actually uh, trials, and they looked into many, many things. Actually, starting from the first empiric study, where looked at patients with CKD and cardiovascular disease also, but they have followed that with other like embryo reduce, which is for patients with having CKD and hep rep, or embryo preserved to have hep bip, or impulse study with an acute uh, event, cardiovascular embryo kidney, which looked at primarily patients with kidney disease uh, from variety of reasons, together with cardiovascular disease and impact MI. So variety of study, I will not take you all through the study because it will take us longer time, but I'll take about embedding, which has been looked at more than 7,000, uh, 4,687 uh, patients. And they divided them between uh, uh, two groups, uh, placebo and uh, patients with, uh, with uh, uh, placebo versus uh, embegloflozin. And they found the incident of worsening and nephropathy was uh, reduced by 39% in the patient who received the embegloflozin compared to placebo, which is one of the first studies which has uh, really shown the interest in, of using SGLT2 in uh, patients with uh, uh, diabetic kidney disease. And you could see here now the reduction for patient with events, quite clear with embegloflozin, death from cardiovascular events was reduced, death from any cause was reduced, and hospitalization for heart failure was also significantly reduced by embegloflozin. So it's not only renal specific, but also cardiovascular disease, which has been significantly reduced in patients with type 2 diabetes and uh, cardiovascular disease. And we look at uh, here, actually, uh, anything to here, to the left side here, which in favor of embegloflozin. So if you take all the patients or take patients with uh, hospitalization for heart failure, all-cause mortality, all-cause hospitalization was significantly reduced in patients who are on embegloflozin. So the empiric study outcome trial reduced the risk of instance of worsening uh, kidney disease, which is uh, significantly in all patients, whether you're progression to macroalbuminuria, whether you're doubling of serum creatinine or initiation of renal replacement therapy, all has been reduced in patients on embegloflozin versus placebo. And when you look at the graph, you find much beautiful 39% risk reduction on the new onset or worsening nephropathy in patients who has been on embegloflozin. Similarly, new onset of macroalbuminuria has been reduced by 38% risk, uh, risk reduction in patients who are in embegloflozin. Some, uh, much more clearly, doubling of serum creatine with age of heart uh, less than above 45 ml per minute was reduced by 44% in patients who are in embegloflozin compared to placebo. And the time to initiation of, of uh, CRRT based therapy was reduced by 55% in, uh, in patients who are on, uh, uh, on uh, embegloflozin. So this actually will show you very clearly in the slide, whatever take all patients, or patients with GFR is more than 90, so at all across different GFR. Patients with GFR more 90, 60 to 90, or less than 45, all has benefit from embegloflozin. Similarly, for protein, whether you talk about protein less than 30 or more than 30, microalbuminuria or macroalbuminuria, all will benefit in patients who are use, use, using embegloflozin. And this is the summary for the real specific outcome 39% uh, risk reduction compared to cardiovascular death, cardiovascular death all cause mortality by 30% and risk for hospitalization for heart failure. So it's certainly all. It looks at the real specific outcome and it looks at also the cardiovascular specific outcome and all cause mortality. This is a, another post hoc analysis in Jason, which looked at the slow uh, decline of type 2 diabetes, slow analysis from Umberg study, outcome trials. And if you look at, for example, the red here, the embegloflozin slide compared to the placebo slide, you see very clearly, and here you look at, at uh, the overall population, uh, prevalence CKD, microalbuminuria, macroalbuminuria, uh, a variety of things. You find the, the, the black is the placebo and the red is the empagloflozin. And you found, for example, the drop is much more significant in patients who are uh, on placebo. And the slope of the line actually is not really straight, not coming down, it's not just straight line, even it looks slightly upward uh, at the end of the study. And this has been done uh, with this, again, other uh, post hoc analysis. They look at the actual type 2 and the use of uh, uh, ACE, ARB, and other, and they found the benefit 
from empagliflozil is irrespective to medication use at that time, whether you talk about ASR, diuretics, calcium sugar blockers. So it's really the benefit is there uh, irrespective to drugs used. And that also is, is not just only due to patients who have received uh, uh, ASR. The embryo, the patient who have hip breath, uh, actually reduced ejective fraction, and they looked at reduced risk of, of uh, interstage disease or sustained profound decrease in GMR, and they found when you compare empagliflozin compared to uh, placebo, this different study, they found there is at least 51% hazard ratio, and there is 49% uh, relative risk reduction in this group. The EMPA kidney is the thing which reconstructed the kidney from all, uh, actually, uh, across the world. Does not look at only just one demographic population, looks at more Asia or Europe and uh, America population, and also looked at different GFR, different cause of CKD, and uh, they looked at primary outcome, uh, kidney function loss, sustained reduction of more than 40%, sustained GFR less than 10, or in stage 9 disease or renal death, all this has been taken as primary beside the cardiovascular outcome. And when you compare the MBA kidney compared to credence or double CKD, the MBA kidney looked at all uh, uh, sort of GFR from 25 up to 90 and looked at all protein of less than 30 to more than 300. So that's really uh, make it really unique in this uh, uh, for, for. So MBA, MBA kidney patient, uh, they were receiving actually empagliflozin only 10 milligrams, not 25 milligrams, compared to placebo. And they looked at 3,273 patients uh, in, the, in this one, and uh, also 99% uh, uh, and patients with the placebo who completed the study. And they continued for up to 2.4 2 years. And the more interesting is the Emba kidney here, you found that diabetes only constitute less than one third of the patient. Who has? And it's really important. I have to mention this one: that patient with EMBA kidney diabetes reconstitutes really than one third of the patient who uh, are in the study because you have actually hypertension, twenty-one percent; you have glomerulus, twenty-two percent, and other diseases, uh, also twenty-six percent. And look, actually, also that patient there is fifty-four percent patient has no brief history of diabetes, and twenty-seven percent they have already cardiovascular disease. So it looks at a big group of patients. Different GFR, they looked at different uh, types of causes of uh, CKD, looked at also different proteinuria, less than 300, more than 300. And here is the primary composite outcome, which kidney disease progression or cardiovascular death, and found there is risk reduction by 28% in the EMBA kidney study in all group, diabetic and non diabetic. And the most primary outcome, look at the kidney disease progression, uh, the, 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 the improvement in EMBA was much uh, uh, clear with the risk reduction about 29%. Cardiovascular death has been reduced by almost 16%. Uh, all cause hospitalization was also reduced by 14%. And all secondary outcome, which is first uh, educated uh, 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 heart failure hospitalization or cardiovascular death was reduced also, as you could see it here, by 16%. Uh, a key secondary outcome was all cause mortality was also reduced. Uh, by 13%. Uh, and here you see the EMPA kidney has proven uh, superiority to, to placebo in all kinds of CKD, irrespective to diabetes, irrespective to proteinuria, irrespective to GFR. It has significant reduction of primary and secondary outcome. And if you look at, actually, there is other study regarding canagliflozin, which showed closely similar results, and also dabagliflozin, uh, has been shown, which suggests that it's really probably a class effect. Uh, certainly, Pagliflozin is uh, uh, has uh, looked at uh, uh, much wider range in terms of the GFR, the proteinuria, in terms of cardiovascular uh, events, and, and and variety of other things, and looked at primary secondary outcome and more specific, specified uh, uh, endpoints. But at the end, it's probably, um, uh, I mean, it, it's shown that there is a significant uh, benefit from uh, SGLT2 irrespective to the, 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 the medication use. When you look at the GLPA, uh, uh, GLP1 uh, receptor antagonist, which is uh, has been studied in many studies, and if you look at this one here, 
you look at uh, the study where they compare between GLP-1 like semaglutide and other linaglutide and others compared to DVB-4 inhibitors right? like linagliptin, cetagliptin and others, they found actually uh, significant risk reduction by uh, uh, 24%. Uh, when they look at the long acting one, which is like the dilugratide, uh, trulicity, uh, trulicity here has been uh, looked at uh, uh, between patients. The both patient was using uh, Lantus, insular glarcane as a reference group compared to 0.75 uh, uh, milligram weekly of uh, dilugratide. Uh, dilugratide uh, 0.75, which is really half the, uh, the, the standard dose, but that's the beginning. And compared to the full dose, 1.5 milligram of dilugratide per weekly, and they found the hazard ratio was much lower, 0.45, compared to 0.65 especially if continue for a longer period of time. And there is actually many studies with semiglutide with the cardiovascular events and has shown beyond any doubt that these drugs, which is the, 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 the GLPA, uh, has shown that really uh, also uh, uh, benefit. But the benefit of them is really rarely exceed 20%, not the same like the GLT2, which is about 40 to 50%. So when you look at here, two drugs actually, they are can, can be used, in patients with uh, diabetic kidney disease and also in patients with, car with associated cardiovascular outcome, both of them are beneficial. That has led actually many of the international body to suggest that, uh, like like uh, American Diabetic Association, that you have to use a GLT two number one number one here. But if you cannot use it for reason or other, you can go for GLP one receptor agonist. But uh, if the uh, hemoglobin O C is still high, you might add GLP one uh, receptor. To SGLT2. That's a recommendation from uh, American Diabetic Association. If you look at the American Cardi uh, uh, College of Cardiology, and uh, uh, they looked actually at the key ego, both of them they state the same that in case that you have diabetic kidney disease and you have cardiovascular uh, disease associated with it, you might use actually SGLT2. It's must, it's must use SGLT2. And if you cannot use it, you might go into GLP and you can combine both of them if the hemoglobin A1C target has not been achieved. Similar to this one, the ERA and, um, uh, guidelines is close, similar. And as I said, the KDEGO has mentioned that with the European uh, Society of Cardiology also recommend the same, that SGL2 is a must in patients with uh, uh, type 2 diabetes, CKD, and especially if they have uh, cardiovascular disease. And uh, GLP-1 uh, is uh, uh, an alternative in case that there is contraindication or if the hemoglobin A1C was not achieved. Uh, before we, we will just look at the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, I will not touch upon this one, but just to complete the subject, uh, like fenironone has been actually, it's a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, which can uh, bind to the receptor here, and inhibition of inflammatory inflammation and, and, and fibrosis. And the reason for that, actually, if you look at this, uh, especially video study, when they looked at loss sartan has reduced only 16%, leaving a huge residual risk here to work. And that's why, actually, SGLT2 covered most of this area by at least 40% the risk reduction. Uh, so this tells you that probably still there is uh, uh, actually uh, room for other medication in the future, and, uh, and which would cover actually the inflammatory and uh, fibrotic theory. And uh, this Hedero study, which has shown there is some, but the risk reduction only by 18%. This is not the same like the SGLT2, which is more than 40%. But here in Fidelio, where Fenerone, the risk reduction about 18% only. But it tells you there is another drug which might work on different mechanisms other than the, uh, the, the, the other theories. It works actually on inflammatory theory. Uh, and actually, it does reduce proteinuria and does not affect blood pressure and increases potassium slightly by 0.23 milliequivalent. Okay, so that's actually, as I said, it's 18% only risk reduction and fenderonol compared to about 40 to 45 to 50% of patients with on SGLT2 like imbagloplosin, which is really quite profound. But again, it's another uh, other weapon in your uh, uh, webinary uh, to use in case that you want actually to, to decrease the progression of CKD. Okay, so I, I will not talk about, but. Uh, this actually the number to treat for uh, uh, for 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 patient with fenderol is about twenty nine, which is really quite low, which is really quite interesting, and I will not touch upon this one. But this one will summarize all what I've said.
will summarize what I've said, saying that there is um, uh, there is three domains we have to target in patients of diabetic kidney disease in order to reduce CKD progression. And number one is the metabolic theory, and we have to have adequate blood sugar control, and this can be done by SGLT2, actually, by insulin, SGL2, and GLP1. The hemodynamic theory can be uh, reduced by ASR and also by SGLT2 inhibitor and other antihypertensive and by weight loss. So certainly hemodynamic theory is really a must. Hemometabolic has been shown before from uh, DCCT study and on and uh, Gomamoto and others who studied it for over many years that adequate control of metabolic uh, of metabolism of diabetes, especially blood sugar, will reduce the progression. So we have to pay significant attention, and we are fortunate enough that we have this now CLT2, which really had significant impact on blood sugar control and also significant impact on the hemodynamic uh, theory and also significant impact on weight loss because there is weight loss. Uh, actually, both uh, CLT2 and GLP1, they have weight loss in both of them. So I think we're really fortunate enough to see this decade. We have left actually three decades, like Professor Ahmed Twelly, if you tell you that all what we have uh, 30, 35 years ago, we have only kept Brill. Uh, then we moved to state for three, uh, 30 years, working only in ACE, then R. And we thought that, with, and what we achieved at that time is only 18% of risk reduction. So you are quite fortunate enough these days to have actually SGLT2 and GLP1 uh, agonists to control diabetes, the metabolic domain, and to control the hemodynamic. Here. And we don't forget the inflammatory and fibrotic it still is not that really huge, but for the future, it might be there. And Pedron has been proven that risk reduction by about 18%. There is other medication has been tried, which did not succeed, but I'll mention them quickly. So uh, just to complete the subject, and one of them is berfinidone. But if you know, you know that's antifibrotic, and used into pulmonary fibrosis quite uh, commonly right now. And you find, uh, you never, yeah, I mean, right now, any patient with uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, you find that they're receiving berfinidone. Uh, but for the kidney, uh, it has been used, showed some benefit for sure. It reduced GFR, uh, it reduced the progression of uh, drop of GFR, but the side effect was quite huge, and most of the study was uh, stopped. And you could find here, for example, the com uh, comparison between perfilidone, where there is improvement of GFR, while patients with having placebo, uh, they uh, they have a drop in GFR. Uh, but this actually published in GS in 2011, and since then, there is no other study. It seems that the complication which has occurred with the berfinidone has prevented them from just continuing with this option for uh, the fibrotic theory. Another medication has been uh, used, which is uh, paradoxolone, methyl. And this drug is really beyond expectation. But uh, so paradoxolone has been used in different doses, 25, 75, 150. And they found that the best dose is 75 and to 150 has significant preservation of GFR compared to other dose or placebo. But unfortunately, the muscle spasm and myopathy was quite severe and significant to the extent that the trial was stopped. And even Beacon study has been um, uh, uh, initiated to uh, solve some of the issue in the, this paradoxolone uh, study, but again, uh, was not really um, uh, positive. And then at the end, they stopped the, the study and unfortunately, paradoxolone, uh, uh, despite that showed some success, that did not uh, uh, continue that way. We have another uh, uh, molecules right now in the, uh, working in the lab animal, like uh, caviloin one uh, regulated protein, and some of folistatin. Folistatin it works on the therapeutic theory also. And we have also interleukin-17 uh, alpha blockade has been used in lab animal, which showed some benefit. And producing proteinuria and decrease uh, progression or uh, drop of GFR. But unfortunately, uh, until now, uh, we haven't used in, in, in human. And at that time, we'll see if there is a side effect can be tolerated or will be the same like perfinidone and paradoxolone. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, here I'm talking about diabetic nephropathy, which affects about 50% of diabetics and can be distinguished by longevity of the disease, presence of retinopathy, Benign urine sediment and negative serology. Kidney biopsies indicate only for rare cases when the diagnosis was not clear. Uh, from the treatment of interview, we looked at the three domains, which is optimal control of diabetes and hypertension is essential. Targeting RAS uh, of utmost importance, and I'm sure everybody is using that. 
But right now, we're fortunate enough, as I said earlier on, that we have SGL2 inhibitors and GLPA uh, receptor agonists are uh, must use if applicable, <clears throat> especially if the uh, CLT is not uh, um, uh, cannot be used or the target level is not achieved in hemoglobin A1C. Fenrolone is a promising as anti-inflammatory, anti-fibrotic, and reduce the risk. But only that the risk reduction only is eighteen percent when you compare them to uh, the, the embagliflozin or other SGLT2. Uh, the novel ter therapy is promising, but it's not for now; it's for the future. And that's all that I have. Thank you very much for having me, and uh, I wish that uh, uh, I could have time to show more uh, slides. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saeed. Now I'll give the floor to Dr. Abdelaziz Al Hafid. He will look at the questions and answers and direct the questions to Professor Saeed Al Ghamdi to answer it. Thank you, thank Dr. Saeed, for an excellent uh, presentation. Thank you, Prof. Saeed, for this excellent and informative lecture within short time, really. You bring a lot of information updated, and I'm sure that if any fellow want to go through this, he will take two to three weeks to just collect all this, and he need to just digest it later on. You bring it within 40 minutes, all within a nice way. Thank you very much. Um, this is uh, Abdul Hamid uh, Hamdi Ramadan. He asked a question about uh, he uses GL2, what he said, uh, NGN, and uh, IGN nephropathy and uh, FSGS. If it will be used in lobus nephritis, we use it during the induction or maintenance phase. Uh, well, uh, certainly he is asking a, a, a question which uh, there is no data, but uh, easy I can answer the question. Uh, of course, don't use it in the in the in the in the induction phase because there's inflammatory component there, and there is no benefit from this one. Secondly, the immunosuppression is at height highest uh, highest uh, uh, intensity at that time, and by using a GLT, we might cause some problem at that point of time. So I'd rather. Not uh, despite that there is no data, but I'd rather use it in the maintenance group, based where required stable on minimal immunosuppression. Thank you. This is Louis Muhammad. He asks also, what are the important intervention to reduce the incidence of diabetic nephropathy? What the appropriate what? What is the important intervention to reduce the incidence of diabetic nephropathy? Right, a very good question, and I, 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 I. Uh, Sometimes it could be a little bit radical in my opinion, and people they don't like it. But uh, I, 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 I would say one of my radical opinions that um, uh, if we look at the three domains right now, okay, the metabolic domain, we look at the hemodynamic domain, I will look at also the 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 fibrotic and inflammatory domain three. At the same time, probably will reduce the diabetic kidney disease. And what I'm saying, I was telling my colleague who are really close to my heart, uh, many of them, I said, probably in the future, 10, 20 years from now, we'll not see CKD as the same pandemic that we see right now. Uh, I'm not sure uh, that will happen, but uh, certainly if you look at the three domain, work on the, uh, what you call reducing hemoglobin A1C by whatever measure you, can, you want to do that, uh, reducing the intra, intraglomerular hypertension, and also try to avoid inflammatory inflammation and fibrosis or reduce it. I'm sure in the future probably we'll have much brighter future. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Mohammed Ramadan also, he asked about the any head-to-head -head study comparing the SGL2 with ACE or ARB? Uh, ACE and uh, say it again, uh, Any head-to-head -head study comparing SGL2 with the RASI inhibitor? No. There is post hoc analysis looked at SGLT2. I didn't show it to you uh, uh, during uh, MBA kidney and also DABA CKD. They looked actually the benefit of SGLT2 irrespective to presence of ACE. Okay, so the benefit mm -hmm. is there whether you're using uh, uh, ACE or R, but head to head, there is no. Okay. There is one suggestion. I didn't know this is. I didn't know this is Hilal Abu Zainab. He said, "Thanks, Prof. Saeed. Do you think there will be a need to have the future combined bill containing RASI and uh, inhibitor and SGL2?" Well, I, 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 I don't think so. Uh, the reason for that because 
because you see, and I, I myself actually as a person, I hate to use different medication at the same time. Uh, and even for example, for some special hospital, they have a strategy. They never accept any combined medication. They give everyone separately. But in the future, to increase adherence, as Dr. Hilal said, who is really a person which I respect most in his idea and uh, and expertise, uh, Dr. Uh, the 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 combination of course will will reduce the will reduce the uh, the, the uh, uh, maladherence or whatever you call it uh, uh, non-adherence and it certainly will be of benefit. Like in uh, as a person, I don't like to use uh, combined, especially because you don't know exactly what to stop another. Although right now has been used, right? For example, Zigdo, the combined strategy, uh, glucophage, glucophage uh, was metformin plus uh, dabagliflozin. And uh, it's it's there actually. Uh, some some uh, some is one. It's already there in the market, but it's it's just uh, personal belief. Which is the same. Like uh, I used to have radical opinion, and this one of my radical opinion. Uh, if you allow me, Prof. Said, just in addition to that, just a small comment on the same question. Uh, I do think uh, it's wise to use both this GL two and DRASI inhibitor at the same time. Because you know the mechanism of action almost in intraglomerular blood pressure is the same. It will Sorry. reduce the intraglomerular blood pressure and will lead to, I mean, increase the time of EGFR slope dip, which is maybe prolonging the recovery also. I agree with you. I agree, hundred percent. That's why I, I said uh, it's my 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 practice never to use two drugs at the same time. At if I was as Rasi and uh, I use first one, wait for one month, two months, then go for another drug. And that's probably, uh, like in the question of Dr. Hilal Abu Zainab, if you have somebody who's already used both, for example, use ACE and CLT2, why not to combine in one bill to reduce the non-adherence? I think that's, that's an idea, a good idea for somebody who already known has been taking both medications, like Zigdo. Zigdo, which is available in the, in the market right now, but formula plus uh, dabagliflozin. Uh, it might be of benefit, I don't know. Okay. But I agree with you, Abdul Aziz, certainly. Yeah. Abdullah, Abdullah Muhammad, is there any solution for kidney dialysis other than transplantation? Or oh, this is a silly question. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, all of you know, uh, know about the study of uh, what his name, I forget his name. I met him actually, who they use the microchips. I met him even in Cairo. I forget his name Allah, right now. Uh, but uh, it's it's clearly uh, it's an infancy, and uh, I don't think that's gonna come because there is so many obstacles there uh, uh, to 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 overcome the problem right now. And even they have actually the wearable machine, which is there for more than twenty years, but still did not get acceptance by patients. And even the uh, what you call the uh, uh, efficacy is not that really great. So I think still we are we are, we'll continue with him with us and peritoneal dialysis and transplantation for at least uh, until we retire and uh, all of all of the, the audience. I don't know. That's my uh, my feeling that uh, still we will have long time until we have such uh, innovation. Medication wise, uh, if that's what is the question, uh, medication wise, and as I said, in my radical view that uh, I I think. Uh, Probably 20 years from now, we'll not see as much CKD as what we see right now. Allah Alam. Allah uh, Alam. Prof, uh, there is a question. When we should stop the SGL2? In case of initiation of the SGL2, of course, there will be acute kidney, I mean, uh, deterioration. Initially, for it's two to four weeks. And consider this physiological. But... There is any circumstances or the level of GFR that make us to stop it and oh, well, I've got, time did not show me, but I, I have one slide, very beautiful slide showing meta analysis about GFR drop. Okay. And actually most of the meta the meta analysis was um, against this view, by the way. They called actually acute kidney injury with the SGLT2. And they reached the conclusion at the end that we should not even think about it. My personal view, of course, of course, there will be a dip in the in, in, in the beginning, as we shown by everyone. 
maybe due to dehydration in the beginning where you still tend to have a little bit uh, dehydration or maybe uh, more aggressive uh, uh, what you call uh, vasoconstriction in the beginning until the things will be normalized you will have some dip but at the end will, it will be as i said two weeks will be resolved so i think we shouldn't pay any attention to this one and i even myself i don't repeat creatinine in two or three weeks i repeat it three months late down the road so because i know what's the outcome i know what's the benefit i know what i'm targeting right bro but what about if the patient on diuretic Suppose the patient in heart failure already. Usually, usually diuretics, I advise them, unless they're really having class three or four uh, heart failure, I advise them to cut down their diuretics, honestly. Uh, 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 well, I have very successful story. I, I don't. I have one patient, actually, who had uh, been in hospital most of his time. He had chest tube to remove the fluid around his uh, chest from the heart failure. He's stage four. But the moment, actually... We looked at the heart failure treatment medical ground. Now almost I have two years he did come to the hospital. And one of them is GLT2. So I think probably, and I'm and, and one of the people who's uh, saying that heart failure is easily treatable conditions, okay? And mm -hmm. by adding SGLT2 in this, in this condition, I'm sure it will reduce the hospitalization, reduce the mortality and, out, and negative outcome. Uh, the only thing which I have when you, when you have very high dose of, of, uh, of uh, diuretics, I tend to reduce the dose of diuretic with this GLT2 and observe it more closely. Uh, but at the end, most of them they will come down, come down in their diuretic dose while they are on this GLT2. Very, I have a clinical scenario, a very important uh, clinical uh -huh. case. We have one case with Lobas, and she is young, almost 41 years. Um, and she ended with her creatinine was almost 400, her GFR, of course, the fifth one, or CKD5, I mean. And um, she has very bad ejection fraction, less than 18%, actually. Yeah. And we consult the cardiologist, really. And after she doing the echo for her, she found her heart really almost... Uh, very low, I mean, contractility. And she is young, and the patient, uh, we need to realize her because she has uremic uh, symptom. She start to discuss with me, what about to start SGL2 on this patient? I told her, just initially, really, the recommended dose and the guideline will be above Thank 20 you. ml per minute. But she just mentioned, you know, the efficacy and the important of this drug in the cardiac insult like her situation what she will lose if we give her just 10 milligram of ember i tell her this against the guideline against the, the literature what do you think prof said if we... well, well i agree the guidelines say 20 means 20 means 20 but uh, uh, i mean uh, all the time we use off label. All the time we're using off label. I mean, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, I mean, it's not, it's not uh, hard and fast rules. Tell me, I, I, I'll tell you something. You know that most of the inter our intervention over the last 20, 30 years is off label. Yeah. I use it myself as a label for 20 years before they, before they use it for membranous uh, property and, uh, and uh, transplantation, other things. We use it for many years, actually. I, I remember using it for a long, long time. At least 15 years before they become a standard of care, uh, and I, I think I think uh, there is no no nothing which really prevents us from using it. Uh, uh, and I say, like this this patient, honestly, uh, uh, having low ejection fraction, other things. Uh, sometimes the uremia itself might be responsible for for uh, for low ejection fraction, and sometimes mm -hmm. they might uh, benefit from from dialysis uh, for certain of time. And I have patients actually. Who are lupus? Who we use with them the uh, dialysis for a few sessions, months, and then we stop that after that. I'm not trying to suggest that start dialysis, but I say one of the standards of care is using dialysis. No, the patient we start her only dialysis will insert birth cath, and her actually she was not our patient initially. Her referral physician did kidney biopsy; it came to be class six, all the ah. sclerosis. Three. So that's why we start her on dialysis and she starts to be improved. Yes. In, in case of 
we need to choose one medication, case of DKD, CKD, either GL2 or GLB1. Which one you will choose? The question is, if the patient is actually on dialysis or not on dialysis, or just the not in dialysis, huh? Not in dialysis. Well, I, I, my my choice is still go with GLT number number one because okay. the risk reduction is much higher than GLP. And mm. if you look at all the guidelines, has mentioned that very clearly that you go for SGLT two number one, and after that, if you did not achieve target of hemoglobin one C, you might go for GLP one. So certainly, SGLT2 uh, and bagrofloxin is probably my first choice. Okay. Is there is any time more we can continue, or uh, that's it? Prof, Tully? If there is no more questions, I thank Professor. There is a few. For, there is uh, a few. Irrelevant to the topic, we go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Give uh, me another five minutes. Yeah. What's the situation that leads us to stop the SGL2, I mean, medication? Patient already in SGL2, and there is some, I mean, circumstances, we need to stop it. I, I, for the time, I, I, for a short time or for the... Oh, no. I, honestly, as I said, I don't check for uh, serum creatinine or, or the depth of the GFR at all, and I don't waste my time on this one, not to complicate the situation. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, certainly, I, I have stopped SGLT2 for patient who has neurogenic bladder okay. and who had ESBL infection, or they have some fungal infection there. Those people, certainly, they are clear no, uh, in my judgment. And even before I start, for anybody who's diabetic who had uh, recurrent TTI, especially if they are ESBL, I warned them. I said, uh, if you develop any instance of uh, uh, symptomatic UTI, probably are off this medication. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, th there is many times where you can use, we cannot use good medication for for for, for side effects. And this one actually is the, uh, uh, the recurrent UTI. I know that if you look at the studies which has been mentioned, they are saying that, well, it's not as much as we published before, but I'm still standing by my, uh, my way that patient has recurrent UTI, especially ESPL, Especially in the presence of neurogenic blood, that probably I will not choose to uh, continue with SGLT. This one question from Abdul Hamid. He said some data about the SGL2 can prevent contrast nephropathy. Did you agree for that? I haven't seen it. So maybe he said I haven't seen it. And uh, usually uh, I follow the big thing, but this one probably will require some uh, authentication. I, I'm not sure. I haven't seen it. Me too, but I think this is uh, Umlun Garan. Uh, he mean maybe for acute insult, prevent contrast and for something, but this is you too need to be continued a long time. And especially, I think uh, for me, I will stop it before. Yani, if most of the patients, especially if they have a high risk to get a contrast and use neuropathy, but me personally, I will stop it for a short time. Yes. Certainly, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, the, the beauty about SGLT2, you can stop it even for one month, two months, there is no problem, okay? Because the outcome actually takes years to, to produce. So it's not a, a big issue. Okay, I think uh, I will stop here, Dr. Abdelaziz. I thank you very much indeed for this moderation. Excellent way, and I, Professor Saeed, as usual, I enjoy your lectures, and really, I am, I feel like I'm a student to you. I, uh, I, I thank uh, uh, Bohringer and Haim for their support. They are always there behind us, and uh, I thank Event Group. I just want to inform you that there were there were two thousand two hundred participant and this lectures, which is a very good number. And I hope to see you again in our next uh, webinars. And I want to remind you this, your society, and we always support uh, any help, any advice from any of you. Dr. Khaled Al-Hassan would like to make a last remark, please. 
دكتور خالد nothing more uh, what you said the prof uh, uh, prof متولي so uh, just extend my my thanks to uh, bringers uh, for their uh, general support of our events so without their support we uh, absolutely we cannot uh, continue uh, giving this uh, education and event uh, again uh, professor alghamdi uh, uh, thank you very much for wonderful and terrific talk and wonderful uh, moderation by uh, dr abdul aziz so thank you very much all of you see you thank next you. time inshallah tasbahun ala khair مع السلامة مع السلامة جميعا شكرا ابو حسن مع السلامة شكرا عبد العزيز مع السلامة